Okay, so welcome. Uh, so here's my outline. Uh, so I've got two halves. The uh, first half is more my background in working with PMML, how I came to find that as something useful for the things I was involved in. And then the second half is, if that's a problem, then what's an answer? And so Kamanja is the answer, and I'll give some uh, architecture and some use cases about how that's been applied. Uh, so that's, the, at a high level, the two halves. So I want to survey the audience. It always helps to understand who I'm talking to. So people have different levels of experience, and there's different places you can have experience. Some people might have more experience in data mining, but haven't done that much with big data systems. So just for a show of hands, um, say, how many people have put a model into production? Some kind of forecasting model or clustering model? OK. Um, so we have a few. How about 10 plus models into production? OK. And so the list goes down. 75 plus models in production. OK. So, so there's a few of us. <laughs> um, but now let me go on the other hand and see if the hands are the same or different. So on big data uh, experience, so how many people have put a big data system into production at a company? Show of hands, nice and high. Okay, um, how about uh, put in you know, up to three systems into production? That's a lot of stuff. And so, so this is part of a challenge. And so part of the solution I'm talking about is how could we make that easier? So people can be coming at this from two different areas. They could be coming at it from experience in big data systems, but they're trying to put together something into production that's uh, more complex analytics, or maybe somebody that knows the math real well and the statistics, but they have to put in an open, uh, put it into production, and that's very key. And maybe they want to put dozens or hundreds of models into production. Okay, so in order to help that overlap, um, that's what Kamanja helps with, is kind of that overlap. So uh, the case study, I'll, this is something that I've gone through before, so I was a director of an analytic department. We had uh, three modelers, um, a couple people doing data integration types of things, and we had about three dozen um, predictive models in production. Um, and it got to be very difficult to put in more models because we weren't putting the models in production. We had a different group that was uh, in, say, the, the database group was putting our models in production for us. And so they had all these roadblocks that we had to jump over, and it would take us maybe two months to, after we built the model and tested it and validated it, to get it into production. And I was looking at all the models we had to put in production a year. We wanted to refresh, change models. This was doing with fraud. So if the models got weak, customers had a lot of serious pain, and they were not shy about letting us know about it, because they were paying us to mitigate the fraud. And so I wanted to cut in half the amount of time you know, putting models into production, and I wanted to spend a lot more time doing the thing data miners are good at, is doing the analysis, putting models into production. I mean, putting, analyzing the models so we wouldn't have to spend as much time putting them into production. So I wanted to simplify that. So that's kind of the problem. It wouldn't always be two months to put a model in production, but I've been at other places, American Express, or, or different places where it might take um, a month. Um, so it's not always, uh, one day or two days to put in production. If you can do that consistently, you've got a very efficient organization. Uh, okay, and so the, this group that was a database group, they were very strong in database, but they weren't very strong in the math of algorithms. So they would have one process to put a regression into production, and regressions are kind of simple, field times value plus field times value and a completely different way to put in trees or rules. Um, so that was a pain point I wanted to address. So I'm working on a problem solution result format in this case study. Um, and I, was wanted, I looked around to see if I was having this problem, if it was unique to me, or if other people were having this. So in KD Nuggets, uh, Gregory Patesco Shapiro, it's one algorithm, but also multiple software tools. And so I was founded, I had wanted to use multiple systems as well. Um, but this was verification that I wasn't an oddball. A lot of other people that answered the survey. <clears throat> so here, um, also in the survey, they had a ranking of 
the people using R was the most. Um, and then this is a descending list. So this is just using one tool independent of all others. And then using tools together. So the numbers in the cell, um, the dark green is Hadoop and Spark. So that would be three times average of using them independently. And then the pink are areas where there's two tools not used very commonly together. Um, but the main takeaway isn't the detail. It's just that there's a lot of combinations people could use. And there's some things they do use together and some things they don't. But a takeaway message is um, it's helpful to support a lot of algorithms and a lot of tools. So as I was looking around, I came across uh, one thing that seemed like a solution for me, PMML, Predictive Modeling Markup Language. And the reason I like that is uh, there was uh, two categories of software vendors. There's producers, that's like the data mining tools, has all the, the math, the algorithms for training the models, and then the consumers that would be executing them. Uh, PMML is like a type of XML, um, just like HTML is executed by your browser and displayed. There would be a PMML server that you can make a RESTful call, and it would execute and come back with your score for that given record. So that would execute the PMML. Um, so if you're doing a forecast of, of uh, fraud or various other issues, customer likelihood to respond or a trite or various other things, um, the PML could be used for that. So there's 18 companies that had software for that. Um, R, uh, RapidMiner, Nime, Weka, Spark. So the ones in green are the ones that are open source and also um, have a lot more uh, algorithms that they support as PMML producers. And then there's also PMML consumers and there's about 12 companies that supported that. And I've got the list up there. Um, so under PMML, it supports about 15 types of algorithms. I listed in the bottom right there uh, some of the predictive algorithms and descriptive or other. So it turned out to be fairly flexible. And it could, one thing I was very happy with is it could work with a lot of complex models where I'm <clears throat> working on some models feeding into others or averaging or boosting or bagging. So I had no problems getting as complex as I wanted to. So for the solution objectives is I wanted to decrease the time to put models into production. I wanted to, for me and my team to spend time building the models. And I wanted to support much wider variety than just regression and trees. I, I want to be internally competitive. You know, let's try things out. That's the whole science part. So the solution I went with in that scenario was SAS Enterprise Miner. And while it supported about a dozen algorithms, eight of them were supported by PMML. Um, and then I would use R, and it had a rattle package that was easy to get my staff to use. <clears throat> and so, for example, SAS Enterprise Miner could train, uh, support vector machines, but couldn't generate the PMML. And so then I would use the rattle, because that could generate the PMML. So there was all these different things I found out how to combine one to another so I could get a very broad system into production. But I was very happy with the result. So as opposed to taking maybe two months <clears throat> to put models into production, and I was just limited to two algorithms, now I could put in maybe a dozen algorithms into production, and it would take a week, and we were hoping to get it down to a day or two. Um, because the PMML was automatically generated, it's just like when you compile Java code into a jar file, you don't have to QA the jar. When you do a file, save as PMML, you don't have to QA the PMML. It's, it's compiled. It's reliable. So that takes out a huge amount of the QA process. Um, and also by supporting a lot more software and algorithms, then now we could put things into production that are much more accurate. Um, so that was a big win. Uh, so that was my introduction how I came across um, into PMML. So, yes? Um, no, this was a couple of years ago, and I don't know if JPMML. The question was, uh, what about JPMML? So JPMML is a Java PMML library. Um, and so at the time I was looking into this, um, it was like maybe 2010. And so that was before JPMML. Um, I ended up going with Zementis as the, 
the PMML consumer, and I was quite happy with them as a vendor. Um, but that would be, you know, 50K for the software, whereas, you know, if you can come up with an open source solution, there's some benefit to that. So, um, other questions? Yes. Um, some systems um, back in the night, okay, the question was, what other systems could be used as languages to put a model into production? Is that correct? Okay. Okay, well, there, okay, that's the additional question, but let me, so as first, as far as languages, sometimes in the past, there's different packages I would use that would generate C code, um, you know, from neural nets. Uh, sometimes, I haven't seen SQL generation too much um, for scoring models. Um, certainly, sometimes in Java, um, if you're using Python libraries, I would imagine there'd be some Python. Um, so some of the tools would generate Java, like the SAS Enterprise Miner uh, could also generate SAS code, and then I could put that in production on the mainframe, or there would be other ways that you could generate Java code or PMML. But it wouldn't necessarily be everything that's supported by one language, algorithm-wise, would be supported by others. So that, the question is, what about, uh, let me rephrase your question, model management, version control. And so that's a very valid question. And so uh, in that particular previous experience, there was another large project that got into model management. And model management could be another talk in itself or a separate application. Um, because you have all, just like you have Git or other source code control system, you could have <coughs> a lot of systems for maintaining your models and your model versions and when things are updated and refreshed or re retrained. So in that case, uh, part of the project, um, I spec'd out and the developers built uh, an inside internal enterprise app that my department used. So I had a web interface and we could manage like a rule lifecycle and model life cycles with that. So we had an internal system to manage that. Um, but it seems like that would be a system that would be a good general application to leverage for other companies. Other questions? So uh, it's important for me to repeat the questions because the video pick up just as picks up in my voice. And so we're trying to record the questions so that later on if people watch the video. Okay. So now I've talked about my use case of PMML. Well, maybe I'm an oddball geek that does data mining. There's other uses of PMML that are very important too. Um, so some of them are complex event processing. So if you're handling hundreds of concurrent data streams and you're trying to pick out some kind of um, action on some of the elements in the stream. So um, that's a whole uh, category of software that's focused on that. Um, or enterprise applications. So you're building a very large application something like salesforce.com, only your company is building something new and you want to have a big data back in for it. And there ends up being a lot of complex calculations involved. So that would be another use case, I would call, um, that doesn't involve data mining, it doesn't involve generating PMML, but it does have a lot of complex logic. You know, that could be retail supply chain management types of things or, you know, there's hundreds of enterprise apps um, so yeah, uh, looking at credit card transactions, web transactions, um, massively online, uh, like at computer training types of things. Okay, so looking at uh, Kamanja and comparing that with Spark. So Kamanja is, uh, this is our first public presentation on Kamanja. So welcome. Uh, very new product, brand new. Um, so with Kamanja, our data granularity is one record. Um, you know, we can work with Spark. Spark can work with MicroBatch, but it can also tune back to one record at a time, although it gets a little bit less efficient. Our latency is sub-second. So we're, that's one of the things that we're trying to make very fast with our real-time um, uh, design objectives. So with Spark, because you have the MicroBatch, then you could have several second latency. Yes? Sure. 
Um, so Kabanja came from uh, Ligadata. We're a big data consulting company. Uh, we've been doing various uh, uh, consulting projects for banks, healthcare companies, other things. And so it's something that we've been using and had in production um, for over a year. We probably have like uh, three, four installs right now. And so we've just now are launching it to be an open source product where other people can get to the source code and and <clears throat> you know report bugs, contribute to it just like other Apache. Uh, we're right now. I think we're checking out to see if we're going to be uh, Apache or BSD. So we're trying to figure out our licensing um, details with that. So um, I don't know. Anybody here from Ligadata want to report where did Kamanja come from? <laughs> I looked. I looked it up on Wikipedia, and I found out it's like a Persian guitar, four-string guitar, um, and I believe the website was available, and the um, uh, trademark was available. Uh, so. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I claim innocence. <laughs> so. <laughs> I I haven't come across that one, but that's that's some of the background, and so so we've uh, but we're want to open it up uh, to the community and we want to get other people involved so. Earlier, if you got here early, we were passing out USB sticks if you wanted a copy. Or if you go to kamanja.org, then there's the same download. Um, so it has different virtual machines. And the virtual machines have uh, Kafka, Kamanja, um, HBase, Cassandra already installed and configured to work together. So you can have something out of the box that'll get going. And you can run a Hello World or various other examples of PMML. And I'll go into more details. Does that give a quick overview? OK. So thank you for that question. $5 at the end of the class. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK. So with Kamanja, um, every record process exactly once. And I'll hit more details on this later on. Um, it's very important. As I mentioned, some of our clients are banking and also healthcare. So um, you know, if you wouldn't want me to process your uh, withdrawal of money twice, and have your bank account debited twice, very important to process transactions once and only once. Um, and so that's a much higher requirement than if you're doing tweets or Facebook updates and something's delayed a few hours or, or gets duplicated or missed. Um, and so part of it, uh, and I'll go into later on, is by meeting some of these higher requirements, um, then it, it's tougher for us, but it makes a more solid product for you. Yes. Uh, across the whole system, but I'm sure you could configure it. You know, you could probably get into some configuration corner cases where there'd be problems, but um, but that's where the default design is, is to be once and only once. I'm sorry, to repeat the question, is it is the once and only once just within the Kamanja, or is it as a transaction comes into Kafka, then goes to Kamanja, then goes to, say, back out to Kafka, then maybe HBase or something. So there's a broader data flow. And so, um, Dan, I said I'd pick on you. Um, so is that, uh, is that a correct understanding? OK, thank you. Yes? Yeah. No, I, I was at Databricks a few weeks ago talking to them about it. So they they do want a PML consumer, or at least one that's open source. Sorry, uh, PML is specific, but the model generate an MML, of course there is. A yeah, so you can have generate an MML lib and execute an MML lib. Um, ML lib. Um, there's a lot of duplicate L's in this yeah, talk. Um, yeah, so yeah, so Spark can execute directly in there. 
but if you want to uh, produce models in MLlib and then run them in a PMML, that's a complement that we can offer. So, uh, good point. Okay, uh, yes. Okay, so let me repeat the question. Uh, does a product support decision tables, decision trees, and scoring models? Okay, so to get back to that, PMML as a standard has about 15 different algorithm families it supports. Right now, since we're brand new, and this is just opening our door the first time, uh, we're supporting rules out of the box. And then shortly this quarter, uh, we're going to be supporting you know, a couple other engine types like the regression and trees. And then we want to start going down the list and we've got uh, a methodology of, of approaching to add a wide variety of support. And then we do support lookup tables now. So I am doing a lot with lookup tables and I use that heavily for <clears throat> things like, uh, if it's like name matching, text processing, or if it's a condition on this field is this category and this field is on that category, kind of Bayesian priors, um, then what's the likelihood of the target? So yeah, that's out of the box. Yes? You mentioned the word rules. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, as far as the configuration, sure. Uh, because the question is, uh, could we replace other rule systems? And he mentioned FICO Blaze. Another rule system I've used in the past is, is Drools. Um, that's a, a Java uh, rules uh, base. And so, yes, we can generate, uh, complement or replace that. Um, now, all of the vertical specializations and if they have like mainframe integrations and can you find corner cases that Blaze may cover that we don't necessarily focus on? I'm sure you can find some corner cases. But as far as the general logic of if then else, lots of conditions, chaining rules, yeah, no problem. And then top down and bottom up, so that would be fine. And then if you want to rule editor and you have a non-technical audience, then maybe you could use like NIME and they have a rule editor and they can save as PMML. Um, you had your hand up earlier? Uh, in deployments of multiple models, do you store the blank support and sort of comparison of the models and only in one model versus another, which one is better? <coughs> um, that wasn't in our design to date because that's more in the model generation. So if you're training a bunch of models and you want to evaluate one model against another, now if you want to talk about putting it into production, um, and you want to have A-B testing, champion challenger. So then that would be something that we could do. We could have an earlier stage that would be processing the transaction coming in, roll a dice with a random number generator. You know, if it's 1% or less, then give it to the challenger. Um, otherwise, give it to the, the one that's been in production. So if you want to roll out with A-B testing, uh, then that's something that's certainly doable. Um, there was another question, yes. I mean, the syntax is PMML. So these are not giveaway books. These are mine. But if you want to flip through, you can take a look. Um, uh, so, but the syntax for the rules <coughs> would be in the, the PMML standard. So it looks like XML with tags, just like you would see tags in HTML. What's that? Yeah, yeah. But we compile our PMML into Scala, and then from Scala into jar files, and so. Also, something I'll get into later is we support UDFs or user-defined functions that you can call <coughs> from PMML. And so those UDFs um, that are in Scala, you know, you can do whatever logic you want to in Scala. And so if you want to add that to, to your rules or your system, you can certainly do that. So good questions. I'm glad you guys are asking. Okay, this side's been shy, quiet. I'm going to pick on you guys. Other questions? Okay. Yes. Please repeat the question again for me. Yes. Um, so what would be the 
Yeah. Okay. So let me repeat the question. So um, it's basically in a sales situation what I like to call a so what question, which is very valid. So, so what? Why use Kamanja over something like JPMML? So, good question. The answer to that is JPMML is just in a small box. It's not integrated with anything else. It doesn't have a lot of this other infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's not <clears throat> set up in a big data system. It's not configured to work with um, uh, Kafka or MQ uh, for message passing. It's not configured to integrate with all these things. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, I mean, that would be more of a compliment to us than a competitor to us. So, not, not threatened in the least by JPMML. So, but good question, thank you. Okay, um, so getting back to the Kamanja, comparing Kamanja and Spark. So, uh, Spark has an RDD, a resilient um, data dictionary. Dist distributed, okay, thank you. Um, and then also both uh, Kamanja and Spark are written in Scala, so there's a lot of compatibilities there, or a good complement. Um, and then as I said before, as far as a PMML producer, Spark can produce PMML, and then Kamanja can consume it. <clears throat> and then the adoption for Spark is very wide, and so that would be a great system for us to work with. Okay, so the OSS, or Open Source System Technology Stack, it can be confusing. So I'll start off simple. These are some of the things that Kamanja integrates with. So we're in the center of the diagram there um, for the real-time computing. So in the real-time streaming, you can check off if you want Kafka or MQ, um, or if you don't want streaming. <laughs> uh, the compute fabric can be on a cloud. So many times, companies like banks don't want to do their processing out in Amazon EC2. It'll be an internal cloud. Um, although if they're doing social media analysis, then that would be outside the firewall. Um, and then the data store could be HBase, Cassandra, InfluxDB is a time series database. And we added that, the adapter for Influx, or I should say Ahmed. Ahmed, where are you? Okay, Ahmed added, while we were doing a project, Ahmed just added the adapter for InfluxDB as part of a few week project. So adding these adapters to other data stores isn't much of an effort. Uh, we try and keep it easy. Um, and then for security, uh, working with Kerberos. So again, we're trying to get up to higher standards. And so now the next, the yellow, is looking at upcoming integrations that we're working with. So uh, working with MLlib for the uh, PMML generation, Spark. So Spark could be a streaming feed to us, and then we could have a Kamanja node, um, and then also uh, Spark could be a real-time computing node for training models, and we could be the real-time computing node for scoring models. Um, as far as in data store, stores, you know, if you like MongoDB or you have your various other NoSQL favorites, um, more power to you. It's just add another adapter. Yes? Uh, the, the Kamanja would be a cluster. So, I mean, so like in one of our uh, configurations, we had about three nodes for Kafka and 12 nodes for <clears throat> Kamanja. And so right now we're using uh, Zookeeper, but we can go ahead and um, Yarn looks like a good candidate next. And then there's many other things. There's like 300 Apache projects. We're not attempting to integrate with all of them, but also part of that is simplification and reducing risk for you as possible clients. Um, so there's some things that we, you know, Hadoop is going to be strong in batch processing. We probably won't be going there. So it already has some good strengths in there. Um, right now, in the short term, we're not really getting into search, um, solar, or Lucene, or other things like that. Um, there's other systems that are good for that. We're trying to focus on our complex real-time scoring. Yes. Um, so with the uh, differentiation with Spark is going to be part of the being a PMML uh, consumer and executing, and then later on there'll be some other features. 
Uh, it's not just PMML, but we also have a, a Java custom library. I'm sorry, to repeat the question for the video, how do you differentiate with Spark? And so part of the differentiation is also we can have custom Java models or other Scala code as well um, for um, doing some of that execution. Yes? Um, the, those were yellow because that's something that we're going to be working on. We have the API defined the same. Um, that's something that Dan's been working on. Um, and so, so as we go forward and we start doing more testing, we want to have those RDDs be compatible. But the API is designed to be um, as compatible as we can at the API level. Yes? <coughs> Um, uh, those were grayed out that we don't have in the next three months plans to integrate with those. If you had a project that was, you know, with Elasticsearch as a NoSQL, you're doing a lot of log processing, then that could be integrated with an adapter. And then that could be another data source if you wanted to do lots of log processing or other indexing. Well, yeah, I mean, the adapters can be either for source or sync. So anything that could be one could be for an adapter for the other. <coughs> okay, higher requirements for financial services or healthcare. So there's a lot of legal compliance issues. So these are things you know enforced by law. Uh, you know certainly can't lose or duplicate a bank transaction or a medical record. Um, executives can go to jail. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of regulatory requirements um, and around security, auditability, lineage you know, zero data loss. So just a lot of high standards. So if it's good enough for a bank, hopefully it'll be good enough for you. So well, here's one of the use cases that deal with a bank, um, an existing customer. So driving digital adoption, a bank call center. So in this, they had a integration with a call center where people were calling in, they were pulling up the records and doing some analysis and scoring on there. Uh, on the on the records of the people analyzing their um, their particular calls and and communications, so they were able to get about 8.6 million in savings in the first year. So they're trying to increase the messaging effectiveness. They got about a 400 percent increase or lift um, conversion from the like the phone calls to digital. So that's one of the use cases of Kamanja in production. So also a medical company that had a use case. So just to shorten the name, I say Medco, but it, it doesn't mean the Medco insurance. So they had particular models uh, for uh, looking at the client's intelligence. Um, they haven't shared a lot of details with us. They've been much more, we're going to do development. We'll use your tool, but we're not necessarily using you to do all the logic. Um, but uh, when it, there was an earlier question about rules, so they've had a DSL or a, um, a domain specific language, and they would go from that to express their rules into PMML. And so that was something that they found practical for their situation. Yeah, yeah, so they were using OWL. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so they were integrating the DSL and their ontology. So uh, that was some of the work that they found useful or practical for them. Uh, so the initial model that we're working with is um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease risk assessment. And so as you can imagine, there could be a lot of rules for processing medical transactions and things. Um, also, a lot of times there's models that are streaming and records come through one at a time and then uh, but one of the things we can do is also have a look back period or do some time series processing so that'll be less efficient if you're running very fast if you just want to run you know that won't be quite as fast as running one record and then never touching it again um, but it can give you some much more complex time series processing and so one of the questions is a so what why are you different than Spark? So that would be one of the differences. 
is that we can have a memory, a state, um, where we can maintain that. Um, so with one of the clients, they had an <clears throat> we had an architecture like this. They had a mainframe with a DB2, um, different servers running, uh, Kafka feeding in. The orange section is Kamanja. Um, and in there, so yeah, anything of the orange would be Kamanja. It was working with HBase for history, um, HDFS for long-term storage, and then going back out to Kafka uh, for the outbound queue. And then in there, they had the decision engine. So the DAG would be a, a directed acyclic graph that has to do with the data flow. Uh, so you could have things going from one logic module to another logic module. Um, you could have uh, you know, multiple parents or multiple children, but things only run in one direction. There's no cycles. So that's what we're talking about with a DAG. OK, um, so backing out of some of the detail and the eyes spinning in spirals. Um, so the throughput, uh, well, we're getting millions of messages per second, and that's using commodity hardware. So scalability is linear. So linear scalability, um, and then we're, uh, we have data partitioning support, uh, multiple model optimizations, um, and then consistent performance across hundreds of models and thousands of rules. So a little bit of detail getting into some architecture slides. So there's a, we have the Kafka queue on the bottom left, and that's feeding into the input adapter. So the input adapter and the output adapters are the same, the way you would have an adapter for HBase, or you'd have an adapter for uh, something else. So we have go through a data transformer, model execution, output dispatcher. So the metadata is a module, that, a component that we access for a lot of our components that's talking to that. So the data about the data, configuration, different types of things. Um, so going, say, as we're scoring models, then we could go out to the data history. A lot of times when you're doing pre-processing for a particular record, then you would wanna access history on that particular person. So is this unusual behavior, this particular record? Is this an outlier or a fraud? Um, so, or is this like an insider threat? type of thing. So a lot of that you would access with the data history. So I'll do a drill down into the metadata. So the metadata has different components. Um, there's models. So that would be like the PMML rule set, or it could also be like our custom Java model. Um, containers, that would be like the lookup table, like the Bayesian priors. Um, functions, so that would be like the user-defined functions. So uh, some of our clients are working with uh, Stanford NLP, <coughs> doing some naive Bayes sentiment um, models, sentiment detection models. Um, messages, so that would be the main records flowing through. Um, and so those are the primary types. Um, so also breaking up the metadata. Uh, so we have, a, you can call it through a REST API or go directly to the metadata API. There's a scoring engine manager, so that manages scoring an individual model, and then there's a model manager that we use, and that controls like the DAG. So if you have um, a dozen models all to score a particular transaction or a particular person, so then that would manage the DAG of models. Um, and then there's the various uh, configuration, the cluster configuration engine, uh, model compilation. So now one of the earlier boxes was a, a model runtime. <clears throat> So this is getting the, well, messages come in, um, the checking the metadata, the model object is instantiated, um, message is saved to history, uh, model is executed on the object, um, so we can go through more details. Uh, this is probably getting closer to a training, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, backing out of detail, what happens if a node goes down? So this speaks to robustness. You know, are you going to lose your financial transaction? So there's a Kamanja leader node, and then that would rebalance over all the Kamanja nodes. Each message is processed exactly once. Um, and so it would look at the state of every message through each step. And so if the leader goes down, then the next node on the list becomes a leader, and then it can rebalance. <clears throat> so 
So some integration points. Uh, so as I said, we're going through legal, but our, our license will absolutely be enterprise friendly so that you can use it, you can add software to it, and it's not like now it's a octopus that infects your code as well. So, um, so we have adapters now for any data flow. So these are the various things that we've um, integrate with or we're using. And then also with the custom Java model. So if you want to generate a Java model or write your own Java code, then you can put that into production. Okay, so here's a good elevator, elevator pitch. So KP, as we were talking earlier today, um, so uh, this is a, a clear message if you wanna summarize it. So deploy predictive models and rules in a hundredth of the time that it might take today. So it's an open source, real-time decision engine. It's hardened to meet the strictest, strictest requirements of financial services, healthcare, and scalable to handle Internet of Things. Um, it enables developers and data scientists to reduce the time to deploy rules and predictive models, and it integrates with your big data ecosystem. Um, so now some plan differentiation or future upcoming things. Uh, yes, a question? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll repeat the question. He was just asking me to back up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to be responsive to different people in the audience here. So you mentioned the integration with data, with more crucial data, which is like S3 and Cassandra, right? Yes. So those are the features which require even S6 pipelines to be fine first. So the other issue that you gave is that, for example, of monitoring transactions. If you want to determine whether it's a fraud or not, you want to access the history. Right. So that's what you need. For example, let's say tomorrow you change your model. I mean, so what we would do, so let me repeat the question. So the question is, if you were scoring something like fraud and your model changed over time, um, and as you're scoring the transaction that goes through, let's say currently you're just looking at, at Donald's individual behavior, and instead of looking at just Donald's behavior, we want to look at everybody in the section, okay? And to see what's, what's normal, because maybe Donald switched to a new project in the same department and all of you are in the same department. So maybe it's different for Donald, what he's been doing the last six months, but then it's common to what half a dozen of you other people have been working on. So in that larger context, then maybe it's not so unusual. Okay, so to answer that question, um, so right now, you know, we're writing the data history and we would have a caching layer here. And so as we're distributed, say over, you know, 20, 50 nodes, then, um, then we're going to have caching and we'll, just like with um, uh, a MapReduce type of thing, you would hash on a key that's very relevant and helpful for your caching. So the same thing here. And then if you're going to change what data is being stored, and then you go from the data specific to Donald to the data specific for the group, before you go into production on that, you would want to load the history that could be looked up for that. And that's part of training a model and putting it in production. It's not just putting the model into production, but it's putting in all the support metadata into production to support the pre-processing. So. Yes. Right. Yeah, I, I would say it's a valid question, but it's a application configuration question. And so, so um, you know, can it be configured many different ways? Sh sure. Um, you know, in a situation like that, you might want to, you know, try some experiments, try some different tests on how we configure it. It's almost like, you know, you, do you go to 
third normal form, fourth normal form, then you back up a little bit to go to two and a half normal form because it's more efficient based on the query load. So you could probably take a look at some things like that. But in the, in the past, I would um, you know, update the data, and when I load the new model, then I would also load the supporting metadata. So. Okay. Once and only once. <laughs> okay, so the question is, um, how do we enforce um, once and only once processing and the other components like HBase, if they don't have any kind of rollback functionality. Um, that may be a question for after the talk, although I'll open it up, Mahesh or Dan. No, no, it's, I, I don't assert things if I don't know. So I, that's something I, I, I don't know, so I was just gonna ask. Uh, Mahesh. So uh, persistence is the last step, and if it's done in memory, you only run it after it is set as. So there is no role that there needed. Uh, and how we replay, to miss something is uh, because of Kafka. Kafka can replay any point in time. So we, we create the pointer, and then uh, we take that pointer and say, okay, we have played these many, but this is new. So we make sure that that is. If I may, I'll, I'll suggest a, a conversation after the talk. Uh, so it's a good question to follow up on. Um, so there's another question over here. Um, okay, so I mean as we're uh, processing the different transactions and it's going through the, the various nodes in parallel or Okay, right, so if we have some history, um, so the easiest way of doing that is if you're hashing on, say, customer ID, not transaction ID. If you're hashing on customer ID, then the customer's pre previous transactions would be in cash or could get looked up in cash. So that's one way of, of doing it. Right. Okay. Uh, Mahesh? So, um, in the cluster, we know how many nodes there is. So, if the leader has their DOM and the node which are next to the leader, they pick up and they, they start seeing that the leader is not responding. So, one of them becomes, we have a protocol. So, one of them becomes the leader node. And we know uh, what leader node was processing, if this is what's processing. What the other um, next uh, nodes were processing. And if there is any inconsistency, we replay the Kafka tree for those nodes. Okay. Thank you, Mahesh. Okay, integration points, this. Okay, so some upcoming directions. Uh, so I mentioned some of the A-B testing. Um, we've got uh, a level of integration with Kerberos. <coughs> uh, we can uh, continue expanding uh, role-based security um, is something that we'd be supporting uh, multi-tenancy so also if we have to have SLA support if there's uh, say different departments or sections of data that have to be managed differently if you are performing software as a service um, and then also dynamic scaling isn't yet supported but that's something that that we're looking at doing so to enlarge and shrink is needed based on the load so if there's a heavier load during the week 
lighter on the weekend kind of thing, just to adapt the way um, you know you can uh, do that with um, Hadoop or other systems. So, so, uh, and that's it. So go ahead and try out Kamanja. Go to kamanja.org um, or talk to us. Any other questions I can help with? Yes. Okay. So, so with the security, uh, we're using the Kerberos, and we're and we're expecting that the company already has Kerberos installed and implemented, and so we're supporting their Kerberos um, implementation and configuration, and so then the way they have Kerberos configured, we're playing more of a support role just to be consistent with that. So, other questions? Yes. Um, I think, I believe we were looking at Yarn next. Mesos was something we're aware of, but um, currently it seems like uh, Yarn might be something, you know, closer to what we would do next. Um, but again, being open source, we're inviting c contributions, if that makes sense, or, or help us understand the use case. You know, just like other open source um, systems have a re request for comment, kind of a feature suge suggestion. So that's something that we're very interested in, in soliciting with our our uh, community support. So the question is, have we leveraged any of the code from Spark? Um, I don't think we have, but uh, we it's something that we want to be compatible with, um, and I would imagine, you know, if it makes sense to our engineers, then it's something that we would look into. Um, yes? Um, that slide was ambiguously worded on purpose. <laughs> um, we, we've done various tests where, where it can be, you know, very fast. We, uh, you know, if we have, say, three nodes of Kafka, um, then we can process that with, say, the dozen nodes of Kafka where the, I mean, of Kamanja, where Kamanja is handling much more complex logic. So it kind of gets down to, you know, your processing of records. If your record is just, um, doing uh, a number times two, it'll be very much faster than if you're scoring it with a neural net. So it is kind of a complex question because it depends on what your complexity is. And we're trying not to shy away from complexity. Yes, yeah. And I, as we're doing a release where you've got various um, use cases or uh, that'll come out. So we've got like a hello world um, example, and then we have medium complexity and higher complexity uh, types of things like that. Uh, yes? Okay. So, other questions? Okay. Uh, Bill, are you around? Bill Bruns? Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and wrap up and we can have a drawing. <laughs>